Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Welcome back to the Servants of Grace podcast and to our theology segment. Today's question comes from one of our listeners, and they want to know, how do I fight doubt as virtue with the Word of God? Well, doubt in our day is in fashion. In fact, it it is viewed as a virtue in our culture. Tell someone what you believe, and they'll tell you your truth is good for you, and then they'll proceed to tell you their truth. On and on we go, because... No one has any ground for truth according to this view. In fact, a former Harvard professor, Harold Bergman, once said that a religious law would help no one. And by that, he meant that all law is grounded in theology, the study of God. People's convictions about religion affect how they see and experience the world, which colors how they interpret the Bible. And in recent days, we've also seen people, whether in the news or in the church, come out and make statements that leave one wondering, what is doubt? And is all doubt bad, or is there good doubt? And the answer to these questions are, first and foremost, informed by our convictions. What we believe as Christians informs what we think of the Bible itself. And when we come to the Bible, we come to the clear, inspired, inerrant, sufficient, authoritative, and infallible Word of God. Now, we do not come to the Bible to question the Word of God. We do not come from a place of unbelief. Instead, we come to the Bible to learn and to submit what it says. We do not come to question the text as is as if it's not trustworthy. We come to the Bible to learn and to ask questions of the biblical text. Now, there's a difference between questioning the biblical text and asking questions of the biblical text. Now, when I ask my wife a question about computers, it's because she's an IT expert. She's an IT manager. In doing so, I'm asking her for a well thought out and knowledgeable answer to a question. Now, when I go to the grocery store and talk to someone about my car who who knows very little about cars and chat about what's going on with my car, I'm getting an opinion, likely one that isn't well thought out nor knowledgeable. And when it comes to the Bible, we must understand that it falls into an entirely different category than the two examples I just used. Unlike other areas of life or subjects, there is no leading authority on the Bible. Yes, there are authorities on a variety of biblical subjects, but no one is the master of the Bible. That's what I mean. We We cannot master the word. Instead, the word masters us because of its emphasis on Jesus and how he desires for his people to obey his commandments through the indwelling and empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Therefore, when we come to the Bible, we come not to doubt or even to question out of a place of unbelief. You see, when we ask questions of the biblical text, we are doing so from a place of sound convictions, motivated by a desire to learn more about what the Bible has to teach us. Christians from Calvin to Spurgeon to Owen and others, they are all motivated to ask questions of the biblical text because of their convictions. In some areas of the evangelical church today, there are deeply held anti-intellectualists that reject the idea of questioning from a place of unbelief. To these anti-intellectuals, doubting Thomas is a folk hero. They see how he questioned and how Jesus responds to them. However, this is not what's happening in that passage. Thomas is not the hero of the anti-intellectual movement. He is the hero of those who ask questions with honesty and with reverence to Christ. Now, if you read the Gospels carefully, you can see how Jesus often answers his disciples. Sometimes his answers are sharp. Most often they're filled with great care. Read through John 14 through 16, and you'll see this as Jesus ministers directly to the disciples. He's focusing on ministering to them, and they want to know where he is going. They have no eyes to see, no ears to hear what he's saying. They don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Jesus is teaching them about the coming of the kingdom in his death, burial, and resurrection, and of the kingdom to come at his second coming fully. Unbelief feeds the anti-intellectual movement at its core. There are those who want you to love God, but they forget that Jesus said to love God with all you are requires your mind also in Matthew 22, 39 through 40. So asking questions of the text is not questioning God. Asking questions of the biblical text is not telling God that you disbelieve him. Furthermore, it is not attacking the nature and character of God as unbelief does. God's words are 
in the scriptures. They have a meaning which God intended and inspired through the personality and mindset of the biblical authors. Now, asking questions of the biblical text is part of engaging in sound biblical interpretation. For example, as we come to the biblical text, we should ask, what is the context of this verse? This should be our first question rather than what does this text mean? By beginning with context, we want to get into the argument and flow of the biblical passage. We're aiming after all to understand the surrounding context. So, for example, we might ask, what period of time is this biblical author writing in? Now, we should also ask whether this is an epistle like, like Paul's or if it's in a gospel account like the Gospel of John. Those issues, these issues matter because they will affect how we understand the argument and the flow. For example, in his gospel, John writes as an artist. He says one thing and then comes back to it the same point later on, weaving and painting a story to help his readers understand the point he is conveying. Now, the Apostle John is much more tangible and straightforward. He makes his point and he will often come back to it and expand on it later. However, stylistic difference abound even among the biblical writers, even as they help us to grow and understand more of the nature and character of God and the glory of the person and work of Jesus Christ. So doubt is viewed as desirable in it in our day. To fight against doubt as virtue, we must uphold sound biblical and historical convictions about the Bible itself. We fight doubt not by belittling people or chiding them about what they what they should know. Instead, we are to model it for others. How to engage the Bible from sound biblical convictions. In other words, the way we interpret the Bible is how we should want others to believe about the Bible itself. So whether in our preaching, our teaching, our writing, or our just podcasting about these things, we are saying to people, whether whether they're Christians or not, here is the Word of God. Our duty in doing so isn't to beat people over the head and bludgeon them with the Word of God. Instead, it's to say, here's what God is saying on this subject. We do so motivated by love for the glory of God. We do so, do so to give them space to ask questions of the biblical text, even as we challenge their preconceived ideas that lead them to doubt the validity of the Bible. As we provide safe places in our safe people to ask questions of the Bible, not doubt the Bible, our churches will fight against the anti-intellectual anti tide inside and outside the church. You see, the church has always been full of intellectuals, from Calvin to John Owen. Some of those are of a greater intellect than others. Even so, the church has a long and proud intellectual history that we should not be ashamed of. Christians have helped plant churches, build hospitals, and more to, because they believed Jesus' words about loving God first and then people. This is but one example of how biblical convictions inform practice. It's also another way to say that Christians are not anti-intellectual, but are rather formed by intellectual convictions that are, as Carl F. H. Henry said, of Christianity when speaking of it as Christianity as of a life view. Christianity not only shaped our conviction, it shaped our lives. That is why asking questions is not against loving God. It actually loves God with all that we are, as Jesus instructed. That is how we're going to fight doubt as virtue with the Word of God. When we see the Bible itself, not as a book to question or to doubt, but instead as a book to be believed, to be treasured, delighted in, and devoured, because it contains the whole counsel of God that testifies of the Lord Jesus. That is also how we will provide safe places in our churches to combat anti-intellectualism, biblical literacy, and more, all for the glory of God. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.